A very good evening, friends. I welcome you all to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by the Shankar Ayes Academy. Today's date is 13th December 2023. Before entering our discussion, I have an important announcement to make. See, batch 4 of the pre-storming test series of the Shankar Ayes Academy is going to start on 16th December 2023. Even though the orientation got completed on 10th December, you can still enroll on the program and watch the orientation appear for the first test which is going to be held on 16th December. So, you can enroll in the program and boost your prelim score. Now, back to our business. Let's look at the list of articles which we are going to discuss today. So, without wasting time, let us get into discussion. The news here is that the public sector banks have transferred non-performing assets or NPA of more than 11,617 crores to the NARCL between January to November of this year. See, this is the crux of the article. So, in our discussion today, we will see what is NPA and we will also discuss about NARCL from our prelims perspective. First of all, what is non-performing assets or NPA? See, NPA refers to the loans and advances that are in default or in arrears, that is, principal and interest payments are late or missed you may note that for a bank the loans given by it are considered to be the assets of the bank so as per rbi an asset becomes a non performing when it stops to generate income for the bank so if the principal or the interest or both the components is not being paid back to the lender then it will be considered as a non performing asset put it simply npa is any asset of a bank which is not producing any income and these npas are declared by the concerned banks as per the rbi a non performing asset is a loan where interest or installment of principal remains an overdue for a period of more than 90 days in respect of term loans the bills which is remaining overdue for a period of more than 90 days in case of a bills being purchased or discounted see any amount is said to be overdue if it's not paid on the date of due as fixed by the bank See the installment of principal or interest remained overdue for two crop seasons for the short duration crops moreover the installment of principal or interest remained overdue for one crop season for long duration crops see the last two parameters which we have discussed with me respect to the agricultural loans see this is all about the basics of npa now let us move on to national asset reconstruction company limited or narcl see NARCL is a bad bank created by the government. The NARCL has been incorporated under the Companies Act. Know that the state-owned banks will have a 51% stake and the debt management companies will hold 49% stake in the NARCL. See, it is registered with the Reserve Bank of India as an Asset Reconstruction Company or ARCs. See, this is under the Surface Act 2002. here let us see a little brief about the bad bank see bad bank is a financial institution that primarily deals with the distressed or non performing assets the primary purpose of a bad bank is to separate the non performing assets from the performing or healthy assets of the bank the separation helps the main bank to focus on the core functions without being weighed down by the troubled assets okay now coming back to our discussion as a bad bank nacl will pick up the bad loans from the commercial banks it would then sell them to the prospective buyers of the distressed assets the nacl will also be responsible for valuing the bad loans to determine at what price they should be sold okay to resolve the npa crisis in our country the government along with the nacl has also set up indian debt resolution company limited or idrcl see idrcl is an asset management company just like our narcl this entity will provide management and resolution of asset support to the narcl this company will evolve strategies to ensure the best possible recovery and the resolution process of the bad loan the public sector banks will hold a maximum of 49% stake in this idrcl the remaining 51% will be with the private sector lenders okay having covered all the basics of these two separate entities we will now look at its working with an help of a practical example now let us assume ms devi borrowed 200 crores from the state bank of india to set up a business but due to covid induced lockdown the business failed and mrs devi failed to repay the entire loan of rupees 200 crores so for sbi the loan given to mrs devi has become a stressed asset so sbi is looking to sell off this asset 
This is where NARCL will come in. NARCL will negotiate with SBI and buy the 200 crore asset for rupees 100 crores. The NARCL will pay 15 percentage of the agreed price that is 15 crore in cash and it will pay the remaining 85 percentage that is 85 crores in the form of security receipts. Then NARCL will take the help of IDRCL. See as we have discussed already IDRCL will provide management support now. So IDRCL will use its expertise and manage the asset. It will try and maximize the value of the asset. Once this is done. NARCL will try to sell it to other prospective buyers for the profit. Say it finds a new buyer, Ms. Rani, and sells that assets of Devi to 120 crores. In such a scenario, NARCL will pay the balance 85 crores to the State Bank of India. It will also pay some money as a consulting fee to IDRCL and it will also make a profit as the asset is sold at rupees 120 crores. See, this is what happens if NARCL is able to sell the asset for profit. Now let us see the other side of the coin. Now if NARCL is not able to sell the asset as a profit even after seeking the help of IDRCL. Let us see this scenario also. Let us assume Mrs. Rani is a better negotiator and is not offering anything above 80 crores. In such a situation the government provides guarantee to the NARCL. This difference between what the commercial banks were supposed to get and what NARCL was able to raise will be paid by the government. So as per our example, the government will pay 20 crores to the NARCL. See this is how NARCL and IDRCL will function and helps to dispose the stressed assets. In simple ways, NARCL offers the same service as provided by Murli Prashad Sharma in Munabai MBBS or Rajaram in Vasul Raja. Okay, finally before concluding, let us see how NARCL is different from the already existing ARCs. See, in NARCL, the PSBs, public sector banks, are the majority stakeholders. So, it will have a public sector character. At present, ARC is trying to take a steep discount on the loans. But since NARCL is a governmentally backed one, it will have a deep pockets. That is, it will have a substantial financial resources or a significant amount of money at their disposal. See, this is used to buy out the bigger accounts and thereby freeing up the balance sheets of the bank. See, this is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the basics of non-performing assets and we also saw the working principles of the NARCL and IDRCL. Okay, with all these learned points, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis. Look at this editorial article. This article is written in the backdrop of a recent Supreme Court judgment on the abrogation of special powers to Jammu and Kashmir. In 2019, the President of India issued Constitution Application to Jammu and Kashmir Order 2019. This order removed the special status that was earlier granted to Jammu and Kashmir under Article 370. This presidential order was challenged before the Supreme Court. In this case, recently the Supreme Court pronounced a judgment. The Supreme Court stated that the decision to abrogate the special status of JNK Article 370 was valid. The SC highlighted that the Article 370 was a temporary provision and Article 370 itself granted authority to the President to abrogate the same article. So citing these provisions, the SC validated the abrogation of this article. The Supreme Court further directed the Election Commission to conduct the elections to the Legislative Assembly of the JNK within September 30, 2024. But note that the SC did not mention about the restoration of statehood to the bifurcated UT. So, the author of the article says that the Supreme Court should have given a deadline for the restoration of statehood along with the deadline for the elections. See, this author points out the restoration of statehood is important to guarantee a degree of federal autonomy to JNK. It will help the elected government to better address the concerns of the electorate. See, this is the crux of the editorial article which was written in Hindu today. Now, in our discussion, let us understand the advantages and disadvantages of the abrogation of Article 370. We'll approach this topic using our usual main answer writing approach. Now, let us see the question. The question is, recently the Supreme Court upheld the decision of the central government to abrogate the special status of JNK under 370. In the light of this above statement, discuss the impact of abrogation of Article 370 in India. See, this is the question which is asked for 15 marker and 250 words. See, this type of question can be asked in the GS paper 2 under the syllabus of Indian Constitution, Historical Underpinnings, Evolution, Futures 
amendments, significant provisions and basic structure. And this also can be asked under functions and responsibility of the union and states, issues and challenges pertaining to federal structures. Okay, this is all about the syllabus. Now come back to the question. Here the keyword is discuss. If the keyword is discuss, then we have to write a written debate about the given question. We have to provide pros and cons of the issue with some valid evidences. So for this question, we have to write pros and cons for article 370. Now let us get into introduction. Since the question is about article 370, we can write about the background of 370 in our intro part. See, before India's independence, the JNK was a princely state. During partition, the state decided to remain a princely state rather than joining India or Pakistan. But later on, Pakistan launched the war in order to annex Kashmir. So, the then Maharaja of Kashmir, Hari Singh, sought the help of Indian forces. As a result, Maharaja signed the instrument of accession with India. India also provided assurance to provide some special status to JNK. Later, Article 370 was enacted by the Indian government to secure Kashmir relationship with India. This article granted a special status certain special rights to Kashmir. Article 370 allowed Kashmir to keep its own separate constitution which is somewhat independent from Indian constitution. This article also limits the legislative power of the central government vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir. These provisions hinder the complete integration of JNK with India. So in 2019, the President of India issued constitution application to JNK order 2019. This order states that all the provisions of the constitution of India will be applied to the state of JNK. So this order ultimately abrogated the special power which was granted to JNK under 370. Later, this order was challenged before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court recently upheld the presidential order. So as of now, JNK no longer enjoys the special power which was granted under Article 370. See, in this way, you can give an introduction. Here, I have provided the background information from the creation to abolition of 370. You can write some important points from the intro part for the background of Article 370. See, this is a model intro which was given by me. If you have a better intro, write it and post it in the comment section. Okay, now let us come back to our discussion. Now, let us see the body part of our answer. As I said earlier, in the body part, we have to write the pros and cons of the 370 abrogation. First, let us see the pros of the abrogation of Article 370. Firstly, the abrogation strengthened the unity and integrity of India. Due to the abrogation of Article 370, that separate constitution that existed to the JNK got abolished. As a result, JNK residents can now truly enjoy the status of Indian citizens. This allows them to integrate with the rest of India and it also strengthened the unity of India as a whole. Secondly, the abrogation of 370 results in the equal access to rights. See, before abrogation, only the permanent residents of JNK were able to get employment under the JNK government. Apart from this, the outsiders did not be able to buy property in the state. With this abrogation, every eligible citizens of India can get employment under the JNK government. Then, the members from the outside states will also be able to buy property in the state. So, as I said earlier, this abrogation guarantees the equal access to rights in the JNK. Now, thirdly, this abrogation aid in the economic growth of the state. As a result of this uh, abrogation, the private investors can now be able to invest in purchasing the lands and establishing companies in the state. This will result in increasing the job opportunity and it eventually will boost the economy of the state. Fourthly, it will help the JNK people to get better health facilities. As I said earlier, due to the abrogation of 370, the members from outside states will now will be able to buy property in the state. So, more private hospitals will be built in the region. This will in turn increase the availability of the better health care centers in JNK and people will get better treatment. And finally, this abrogation will strengthen the fundamental principles of equality before law. As I said earlier, before the abrogation, JNK have a separate constitution. So, the residents had their own separate laws and rights. This defeated the principle of equality before law. Now, due to abrogation, the rights of the JNK citizens will be equal to the rest of Indians. This removes the special privilege to the citizens and ensures a greater national integration. See, this is all about the pros of the Article 370 abrogation. Now, moving on to see the cons of the abrogation. The first disadvantage is that there is a possibility of violent breakdowns. As significant JNK residents are against the abrogation of the special status, there is every possibility of a violent protest in JNK. This will seriously hinder the or seriously affect the internal security of India. Apart from this, some radical elements also use this chance to propagate their separatist and radicalist ideas. 
this will also increase the threat of terror attacks and it will eventually affect the security of india the second disadvantage is that there is an increased control of central government in the jnk region see after the abrogation jnk has been proclaimed as a union territory with the legislature as we all know the power of the union territory government is substantially lower than that of the state government so the central government will now have a more power over jnk as a result the degree of federal autonomy to jnk will be diminished see this is the second disadvantage let us see the third one there is a possibility of environmental pollution in jnk see as we all know jnk is one of the main attractions for the tourist so due to the abrogation of 370 more private business will engage in building the tourist infrastructure in the state availability of better tourist facilities will lead to increased inflow of tourists so if the government own employ proper management plans this will increase the waste system in jnk this will eventually pollute the environment of the state see these are all some of the cons of the abrogation of 370 guys i have given you a schema of the body part or if you have a alternative view points you can write and feel free to post in the comment section see this is all about the body part of the answer now let us see the conclusion in the conclusion we can give a balanced view of the abrogation the conclusion can be like there is no doubt that abrogation of article 370 will strengthen the unity and integrity of india abrogation of this article brought the people of jnk very closer to the other state people this will foster a better relationship among the people and will further the socio economic development of both kashmir and india but soon the central government should restore the statehood to jnk in order to guarantee a degree of federal autonomy this will help the jnk government to better address the concerns of the electorate see in this way you can give a conclusion for this answer as i said already i have given you my scheme of conclusion so if you have your own conclusion feel free to write and post it in the comment section see this is all about this discussion in this discussion we saw about article 370 its abrogation and the pros and cons associated with the abrogation of article 370 so with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and let us take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article The annual Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence Summit was started in New Delhi yesterday. The previous summit was held in Osaka, Japan. Know that in 2024 India will be the lead chair of the grouping. Our Prime Minister while addressing the summit made some suggestions to make the use of AI safer. He also mentioned that by only ensuring the transparency and safety the use of AI can be expanded. This is about the crux of the article. In this context let us see some points about the global partnership for artificial intelligence or gpai the gpai is a multi sector initiative this initiative brings together experts from science industry civil society government and international organizations to boost the international cooperation in artificial intelligence technology this initiative was framed as per the oecd recommendation on artificial intelligence let us see the basics of this initiative See its establishment was announced during the 2018 G7 summit by Canada and France. Know that it is often described as the fruition of an idea developed within the G7 nations. After the process finally the initiative was launched in 2020. In 2020 there were only 15 members and note that India was one of the founding members of the summit. Currently the GPAA membership has expanded to 28 member countries and European Union. Let us see the organization structure of the organization. In terms of organization structure, the GPAI has a council, steering committee and two center of expertise. Actually, the two centers are in Montreal and in Paris. This is about the basics of this global partnership. Now let us see the objectives of it. Its objectives include firstly facilitating the international cooperation, secondly reducing the duplications, thirdly acting as a global reference point. for specific ai related issues fourthly promoting the trust in the artificial intelligence arena and finally ensuring the adoption of a trustworthy ai and as a part of this mission gpa will mainly focus on certain thematic areas of cooperation let us see the thematic areas they are responsible ai data governance future of work innovation and commercialization see by adopting the objectives GPI aims to aid in the responsible development of AI which is also called as trustworthy AI. See this is all about the objectives and missions. See I mentioned that GPI aid in the development of trustworthy AI right? The GPI has a set of principles that must be adopted by developing an AI to make it a trustworthy one. 
let us see the principles of it this principles are inclusive growth and sustainable development human centered values transparency and explainability robustness security and safety and finally accountability by adopting these principles ai can be made a trust over tier 1 see this is all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about an important organization called global partnership for artificial intelligence in the second part we saw about the principle which should be incorporated to make the ai a trust over tier 1 so with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis the article here is about the impact of global warming on indian monsoon see indian monsoon is a already a complex phenomenon global warming has made this even more complex see this is about the article in our discussion today let us cover some various terms related to indian monsoon that are often asked in the preliminary examination see first of all what is monsoon know that the term monsoon refers to the seasonal reversal in the wind direction during a year that is between summer and winter seasons in india there is a double system of seasonal winds which cause two different monsoon patterns see these two different monsoon patterns are southwest monsoon and northeastern monsoon let us see southwest monsoon the southwest monsoon season falls between june to september during this season the wind will flow from the sea to land during the summer this is due to the differential heating of land and sea we know that during summer the northwestern part of india become very hot due to high temperature this is mainly due to the apparent shift of sun in the northern hemisphere now due to high temperature over the land in summer a kind of low pressure develops over the land so the winds blow from the neighboring ocean towards the land since these winds are of maritime origin and blowing over the warm water bodies before they reach on to the land they are often containing moisture that is they are moisture laden this in turn cause ample rainfall in the summer season the sudden onset of rain is called break of monsoon or burst of monsoon see this is why southwest monsoon period is the chief rainy season for whole of india know that about 75% of india's annual rainfall is being due to southwest monsoon And then secondly the northeast monsoon in winter the sun's apparent position is vertically over the tropic of capricorn so the land develops high pressure while the ocean develops low pressure so that naturally there is a flow of monsoon is reversed to form the northeastern monsoons know that this is also called as retreating monsoon see this type of monsoon occurs in india from october to december see this is about the basics of monsoon now let us look at the other basic terms which are related to this monsoon phenomena first of all let us see el nino actually what is el nino to understand about the el nino we must first acclimatize ourselves with the condition which is prevailing along the peruvian coast that is in the eastern pacific region see look at this map this is the ocean current pattern during the normal years in this map the cold currents are highlighted by blue colored lines and the warm currents are highlighted in red colored lines if you notice closely you can find a cold current near the peruvian coast that is peru coast this is called peru current so in a normal year the sea surface temperature in the eastern pacific is cold before moving further let's take a small detour and understand why there is a cold current along the peruvian coast actually cold currents are associated with the areas of upwelling okay now look at this image when there is an offshore wind that is when wind blowing from land towards the ocean or any water body the wind pushes the water on the surface away from the coast so there will be a gap created along the coast to fill this gap cold water from the bottom rises up as you can see in this image this water from the deep ocean is colder than the surrounding areas and the water is also rich in nutrients since water here is colder than the surrounding area it is called cold ocean current so basically when there is an offshore wind then there will be a occurrence of cold water current now look at this map which is highlighting the trade winds if you can notice you can find that the southeasterly trade winds along the western coast of south america these southeasterly trade winds are called offshore winds which we have discussed now now so in the normal years there will be upwelling along the coast of peru and resulting in the cold peru current during the normal conditions there will be less rainfall along the coast of peru and there will be normal rainfall along the coast of australia and indonesia see this is because as we all know it's a warm air there which rises up and causes the rainfall but as we saw along the coast of peru we have a cold current so due to this the air will be also cold see 
we know the basic climatological phenomenon that the cold air does not rise up the atmosphere and there will not be any rainfall along the coast of peru see the world's driest place the atacama desert is in chile is due to the presence of peruvian cold current see this lack of rainfall is actually a boon for peru because as we saw the upwelling brings a lot of nutrients onto the surface the phytoplankton feeds on this nutrients and the fishes in turn feed on the phytoplankton so although peru does not bring any rainfall to the peruvian coast it makes peru a rich breeding ground for fish so we have comprehensively covered the normal conditions during the normal years okay now let us see what happens during the el nino years we know that we have a cold current due to the presence of offshore winds along the peruvian coast this offshore wind is due to the southeasterly trade winds during the el nino years this trade wind will weaken and in turn weaken the offshore winds so in turn the upwelling that usually happens no this will not happen this result in making the sea surface temperature in the central and eastern tropical ocean substantially higher than the normal conditions in other words i am putting it simply guys the warm ocean current temporarily replaces the cold peruvian current this warm current starts flowing during the christmas time therefore baby christ was the name given to this event el nino is a spanish word meaning the child and refers to baby christ okay now look at this map so during the el nino year the water along the coast of peru becomes warmer and the water along the coast of australia becomes colder so due to this during the el nino year there will be increased rainfall along the peru and drought conditions along the australian coast actually el nino affects the fishing economy along the coast of peru and it also causes forest fires in australia by creating a drought like conditions now we have to see a correlation between el nino and indian monsoon whenever it is a el nino year it affects the indian summer monsoon in june to september this is because el nino is associated with the weakening of trade winds which are primarily driving the indian monsoon that is abruptly warm equatorial pacific water will pull the moisture laden clouds away from the indian subcontinent in this sense we should know that el nino is associated with the drought like conditions in india see this is about the el nino phenomenon and we also know the correlation between the el nino and indian monsoon see in this news analysis discussion i have comprehensively covered the el nino phenomenon you can also cover la nina el nino modoki etc on your own for comprehensive coverage of this climatological terms because this is very important from our preliminary perspective so with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article recently the food and agricultural organization fao of the un released a report this report provides an overview about the food security and nutritional security across the world regions so this is the crux of the article in our discussion today let us understand the important findings of the report with a specificity towards india why this is important means you can use this in your main answer for increasing the credibility of it first let us see the title of the fao report see this report is titled regional overview of the food security and nutritional security 2023 statistics and trends Firstly the report says that more than 74% of the Indians could not afford a healthy diet in 2021 see this is a slight improvement vice versa with the 2020 because in 2020 the percentage was 76.2% so it was improved around 2.2% okay now if we compare this data with our neighbors in 2021 around 82.2% of the pakistan faced a difficulty in finding a healthy diet so obviously pakistan performing worse than india but if we take another neighbor bangladesh it's around 66.1 percentage of the population facing difficulties so obviously bangladesh is performing way better than india the report says that if the rising food costs are not matched by the rising income then it would often lead to a poor healthy diet this is the first finding Secondly the report says that around 31.7 percentage of the children in India under the age of 5 years show the stunted growth in 2021 see here stunting refers to the condition where a child under the age 5 has a low height for their respective age the stunted growth of children in India was due to various reasons they include poor maternal health and nutrition inadequate child feeding practices and repeated infections see this is the second finding of the report thirdly the report found out that 
India recorded the highest rate of child wasting in South Asian region in 2021. Here wasting refers to the condition where a child under age 5 has a low weight for their height. The FAO report says that 18.7% of Indian children facing this problem. The report further highlighted that India had the highest prevalence of low birth to weight in the South Asian region. See, in India, around 27% of children born with a low birth weight in 2021. India is followed by Bangladesh and Nepal. The fourth finding of the report is that around 2.8% of the Indian children below the age of 5 were overweight in 2021. the report pointed out that this is a huge health risk that affects the overall development of the children the report also highlighted that around 1.6 percentage of the adult were obese in 2021 fifthly the report pointed out that around 53 percentage of the women who are aged between 15 to 49 in india had anemia in 2021 see anemia is a condition where the number of rbc or the hemoglobin concentration within rbc will be lower than the normal the fa report says that anemia significantly affects the health and well-being of the woman also it has increases the risk for adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes see this is all about the findings of fao report kindly note that and revise it often because all the statistics and data are very relevant for your mains examination okay finally let us see in a brief about fao organization with respect to our preliminary examination see fao is a specialized agency of the united nations it was established in 1949 know that it is headquartered in rome italy the fao comprises of over 195 member states including the european union see the main objective of fao is to achieve food security for all it also aims to make sure that people have regular access to enough high quality food in order to live a healthy and active lives to put simply fao leads the international efforts to defeat hunger see this is all about this news discussion in our discussion firstly we saw about the various finding of the recent fao report and lastly we saw about the organization itself this is all regarding the news discussion now let us move on to the next part of our video that is to discuss the preliminary practice questions now i am having four questions let us solve them one by one see the first question Which of the following statements with reference to the non-performing asset or NPA is incorrect? Let us see the statements and we can examine whether it is correct or not. First statement, NPA is any asset of the bank which is not producing any income. See, as we have already discussed that NPA is an asset of the bank which is not producing any income. Generally, if the interest or the installment of principal which remained overdue for a period of 90 days will be considered as an NPA. So the option A is correct. option b an asset can be considered as an npa if the installment remains overdue for one crop season for crops of any duration see in our analysis we saw that installment of principal or interest will be different for different crops that is for one crop season for generally for a long duration crops and for two crop season for short duration crops so it's different for different crop seasons so this uh, option b is incorrect see the third one generally loans given by the bank are considered as the liability of the bank see in our discussion we saw that the loans given by the bank are the asset of the bank so option c is also wrong here incorrect statements are asked so the correct option is option d see the second uh, question of the day consider the following statements about the global partnership for artificial intelligence see the first statement it was framed as per the oecd recommendation on artificial intelligence see it is correct as we have already discussed in our analysis see the second statement india was the one of the founding members of the gpa yes it is also correct see the third one the main aim of the gpa is to aid in the creation of a trustworthy ai see this is also correct as we have seen in our analysis so all the given statements are correct so the correct option is option c see the third question consider the following statements in regard to the la nina event see during la nina event there will be a low pressure conditions along the peruvian coast see even though we have not covered it in our analysis we should also be aware of the el nino la nina phenomenon because it is often asked in our preliminary examination see here the statement one is incorrect because during la nina event there will be amplified upwelling along the peruvian coast due to this the peru current will be colder than the normal due to the present of cold current air starts sinking in producing the high pressure conditions so the first statement is incorrect see the second statement la nina event has no effect on the indian monsoon see this is also wrong because india will receive more rainfall during the la nina years so it is 
definitely impacting the monsoon of india let us see the third statement it is characterized by unusually cold temperature along the coast of australia this is also incorrect because la nina event is characterized by usually warm current along the australian coast so this statement is also incorrect here the correct option will be option d see the final question of the day which one of the following organization involves in the publication of state of food security and nutrition in the world sofi report see out of the four options the correct option is the food and agricultural organization fao releases this report so the correct option is option b if you like today's video like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding the upsc preparation subscribe to shankar ias academy Thank you.